So good morning. Uh, I'm Daniel. I work at Red Hat. I'm a senior principal software engineer there. I'm part of the real-time team inside the kernel core team. And but my, most of my work is is upstream, helping developing the kernel. I work uh, with uh, helping maintaining SCAD deadline, which is a real-time scheduler in the kernel, doing tooling like the real-time timer dot, the RTLA timer dot, here and the runtime verification subsystem. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, today it's a more practical presentation. Ahmed, is it yours? Yeah. <laughs> so t today is a more practical presentation where I show how to use this tool to debugging the real-time scheduling latency, mainly for the parameter T, but not only. <clears throat> the tool works also for the regular kernel. So this, this is an introduction. I think I don't need to convince people here that uh, that re Linux has been used as a real-time operating system, right? <clears throat> and the motivations are mostly because nowadays the software stack for these modern real-time operating systems, uh, they are being developed for Linux natively and people are trying to migrate like uh, old uh, uh, code to run on Linux to have access to these new kind of libraries, like for example, for AI and all this new cool stuff. And because there are many people that understand Linux, but also because, or mainly because Linux nowadays achieve a good, uh, a good timing behavior, both for latency and for response time in the case of real time. And some key features that help to to enable that is, is like the fully preemptive mode, that is the preemptor T, or the real-time scheduling with SCAD deadline and so on. <clears throat> so one of the problems, however, is that now that we have these new class of tools that would like to use Linux as the operating systems or the embedded systems, right, is that one of the problems is the way that we show that the timing properties of Linux are met. Okay, uh, over the years, Linux has been tested using like a black box approach. That is, there is a tool that simulates a real-time behavior and it measures the execution, the, the, the metric, like the latency. <clears throat> and then uh, there is a report saying, okay, my latency is 10, my latency is 200, right? And, and, it, and it's okay, it works for, for development, but it's not enough for, for many use cases. So just to show what was the state of the art, now like when we see tools like cyclic test, the idea is that you, <clears throat> you have a measuring thread, this thread sets a timer for the future and go to sleep. And then when this timer in, in the physical world, it, it happens when the time reaches there, there is the hardware wakes up something and blah, blah, blah and then the thread is scheduled, right? So, this, in this black box approach, like cyclic test is this, the hardware, uh, wait, the, the timer <clears throat> uh, hits the time, and then it's scheduled this thread that is the highest priority thread, so we have this latency. <clears throat> so the black box approach, it works, but it has some drawbacks. And the main one is that it gives us no root cause. And, uh, and the root cause is generally done using tracing, right? <clears throat> but these tracing features are not that accessible for non-expert users because you need to understand how the kernel works and how to interpret the trace. It's very easy to go there and enable too many things and then the, it, by adding too many things, you have too much overhead and by having too much overhead, you break your analysis and so on. <clears throat> and this, and I mean, after 10 years for me doing this, this by hand, I get annoyed. Right? Say, how can we, how can we change that? <clears throat> but anyways, who, who cares about this thing, right? Uh, other than the, the guy doing the bugging at Red Hat for 10 years. So the point is that nowadays with the merge, <clears throat> we have like the real time to the masses in the sense that uh, all the kernel developers, for example, we need, to care, we need to care about the RT metrics because if they do a change in the kernel that breaks the parameter RT, now it's the, the breaking the kernel itself because parameter RT will be part of the kernel. But not all the kernel developers would like to become a real-time kernel expert because they have other complex things to understand, like file system. I don't understand about file system. And they probably will not be that interested on, on trying to understand why I'm breaking the RT. <clears throat> and, but there's also, like, there are many new projects that people, are, are, that people need the kernel to make them, them possible, like real-world projects. For example, in the automotive, people on the ELISA group trying to, to show the <clears throat> 
why the Linux can achieve the, the latency or people in automation the industry trying to run virtual PLCs that have this cadency very precise. So there are many people reaching to these to the real-time kernel. And it's hard to think that everybody will become a real-time kernel expert, right? So we need to build tools to facilitate people's life. So what is the timer lot? So it, it's, a, it's a new approach to this idea. <clears throat> so breaking down this tool into pieces, it has like a kernel and user space components that tries to automate the, the, the measurement and the root cause analysis for the scheduling latency. So in the kernel side, we have a, a kernel tracer <clears throat> that is, op it is optimized to have as low overhead as possible to not influence too much in the latency metric, right? <clears throat> so we have the, this, this, this tracer, the name is the timer lat tracer, it's a kernel tracer. And uh, it, it has also some uh, trace points that are based on the, the OS noise tracer. And here you have a, a, a academic paper published at uh, IEEE Transactions on Computers, where I explain like the, the internal bytes, parts of this OS noise tracer, trace points, and timer lot. <clears throat> Okay, just out of the scope, but this, this, this paper has been like the most uh, accessed paper in this journal for almost one year. It's, it's a nice thing. It's, it's open access in this journal. And so we have this tracing infrastructure to measure the latency and a workload simulator. That is, there is kernel threads that simulate that real-time workload to measure the latency it suffered. <clears throat> so that part's in the kernel. It's more kernel experience people. <clears throat> but then to try to make that kernel part accessible, there is a user space component. That is the RTLA timer lot tool. So uh, RTLA is a suite of tools to, to analyze the kernel behavior for real time, real time Linux analysis. And inside of it, there is this tool, which is timer lot. So it's a benchmark like interface <clears throat> for that in, in kernel infrastructure. <clears throat> And it has like two skins, let's say. There is a skin that looks like the top tool that keeps showing you interactively what is the latency of the system or to build a histogram to make a more statistical analysis. And the, the tool also has an, an auto-analysis module that I will show later how it works, but that, that can give you the root cause for a bad latency. <clears throat> and it also has the possibility of having a user space workload extracting the kernel. There is kernel space and user space workload. <clears throat> So just a practical intro. So do you remember that, that previous example where we have like the measuring thread that sets up the timer for the future and wakes up? So it uses basically the same approach here. There is a, a, a measuring thread that can be in kernel or in user space, you choose, and it sets a timer in the future. When this time comes, like the, 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 the hardware will set the signal to the operating system that is raising an IRQ. On the timer lot, we have a special IRQ that handles that timer. And so we can already start measuring what is the latency for the IRQ. And then this IRQ wakes up the thread and we can measure this, this latency, which is the total thread latency. <clears throat> but we'll get into that uh, later explaining more, but just have an, uh, an overview. So here is one example of the two <clears throat> running uh, in, in a system with my developing box. It's running a kernel compilation in background. That's what is on that terminal. And then I will set the, the tool, RTLA timer lot. This is the top skin. And it to start measuring the latency. In this, in this side here is the IRQ latency. And this is the thread latency. The thread latency is the similar to the cyclic test output. And it gives like what is the current latency, what's the minimum latency, the average and the max for the thread and for the IRQ. And here you can see like the, the overhead is, is very minimal, just have an idea. So here the minimum latency is two microseconds. So even though it's tracing in the background and collecting data, <clears throat> it's not influencing that much in the system or, or barely nothing. <clears throat> so that is the top interface. And this is the histogram interface. So just limiting to the CPUs. So here it is dispatching the workload, dispatching the tracing, collecting data, and setting the histogram collecting the background. Ahmed? The microphone.
Sebastian looks grumpy, but he's a good heart. Uh, so when you when you talked about the measurement thread, was it in user space or in kernel space? You can all? choose in kernel and user space. Oh, in Here the, in this example is in, is in the kernel, but you have the user space as well, okay. and it has another fields in the at the end. I, I will show that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Thanks. From the scheduler training point, it doesn't matter that much. It, it, for example, in the scheduled deadline, I don't look if it's a kernel or a user space thread for example, on the RT as well. It's just that when you are a user space thread, you generally inherit some configuration like C groups, and that influences. <coughs> we had cases where people, for example, was using like some mechanisms like timer FD to, to put their handlers, and then this is where extra latency was induced just because the user space mechanism yeah. chosen, so this is why. No, no, it has in kernel yeah. and user space, yeah. both cases. Yeah. Thanks again. So, when, but, okay, that, that was the, the interface like a benchmark. But when we are debugging the system, we generally have a maximum acceptable latency. That is, on my system, it's working fine as long as it's like less than uh, 100 microseconds. If it's more than 100 microseconds, I assume it's a fault and I need to analyze it. <clears throat> so, and that's where the, the, the magic starts to happen. With timer lot, I can set it to stop if the latency is higher than a number. And then if it hits that, uh, that case, it will print an output saying, okay, he's, he, here's the root cause of the problem. <clears throat> so you can set it if it's for the thread latency higher than, or the RQ latency higher than, or it, there is a magic, in, a magic option that is dash A that will try to enable for all the things. So if it's thread or RQ, and you try to, to use the full options. Like, let's say, the best options for this analysis. <clears throat> so here's one example of the timer, of the analysis. It is set to stop if it's more than 30 microseconds. It just started running, and then it immediately stopped. And here is explaining the root cause. And the, in the presentation, I will explain what are these components. And that's the idea of the presentation. Just to have an, uh, <coughs> a look. Uh, so, <coughs> the autoanalysis output, that's, that's where we started looking at what is the root cause for a bad latency value. <coughs> so, the autoanalysis that, that print at the end it tries to decompose the latency into a set of variables. And which variable can be analyzed more or less uh, independently? And this is based on a research I presented in 2020 at the, at the ECRTS conference, also at the plumbers. <coughs> there is background for these variables and why they are independent. But just skipping here for, 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 for the time of the presentation. So uh, IRQ and threads, they have different analysis. So the autoanalysis, it, it prints parts for the RQ and parts for the thread. And the autoanalysis here, it works for the parameter RT, but also for the non-parameter RT kernel. It, it's generic. <coughs> so, to understand the autoanalysis, we need to understand some set of abstractions that people use in the real-time theory. So basically, execution time is the time required for you to accomplish your work, like any work that you need to do in the kernel, or any task, they have its own execution time. Uh, the blocking time is the overhead or the delay caused by tasks that have a lower priority than your task. Interference is the other side. It's when someone, something with a higher priority causes a delay. Blocking lower priority, interference higher priority. <clears throat> so in Linux, uh, even though we think on Linux tasks as threads, like user threads, process threads, uh, when we start analyzing deeper, we can see that there are other contexts where uh, work can, can run, basic context, and, and these we can consider as independent kinds of tasks or different types of tasks. So we, we have NMIs that have its own context. We have uh, IRQs that are its own context. These soft IRQs can be said as a, a, its own context, but on the parameter T, they became thread, so they are not that relevant for the RT because they become thread. It's still, um, it's, it's, it's here because of the non-RT kernel where we have software queues. And, and the threads themselves. 
<clears throat> so these are just the basic components to understand the auto analysis. Here is one example of, of uh, an execution of a timer lot that was set to stop if it's more than 50 microseconds, right? And it stopped because of an IRQ. <clears throat> so here is the output. How do I read this output? So here I, I created a timeline explaining what happened, right? For the for the explanation here. So <clears throat> the IRQ latency, that is the time for the the when the hardware uh, raised the IRQ from when the handler started working. In this example here, the IRQ latency was 32 microseconds, right? And the, the, this was when the thread was, when the IRQ uh, handler for the timer hat was able to read the time. But a little bit before it, the handler started working. And the handler started working 31 microseconds after the expected time. So, what, what could cause this delay for the starting, starting of the IRQ handler, right? <clears throat> Blocking, something that with a lower priority that was running there before. And in this case, there is this blocking thread saying, okay, this was the thread that was working. A thread has a lower priority than an IRQ, so it's blocking. So, what thread was running there? It was like this, okay, this, this object to task. And when the IRQ happened, when the IRQ happened, this was the stack trace. So what was that thread running that caused the delay for my IRQ handler? And see here, this part of the stack trace is the, the stack trace of the IRQ handling, right? That from, from the, the things that set up the handler so the handler can start working. <clears throat> so this is part of the execution time, so it's not the blocking. So what was causing blocking? Hmm. There was this write system call in the ButterFS that, for some reason, inside the C group code, disabled IRQs inside of a raw spin lock. That was things that Sebastian was explaining before. So there was a code here that disabled interrupts using raw spin locks, and this caused the delay for my IRQ handler. What was that? So with this. With this starting point here, one can start in debugging the system more precisely. Boom. What, why does this IRQ disable inside the C group, inside the write system call? Ah, and then one finds out that, okay, there is a patch in the kernel that added this change. And one can blame Sebastian because it's Sebastian's patch. <laughs> Sorry, Sebastian, for this example. <clears throat> but then one can also see, okay, this is a legitimate use case. Go, go ahead. Did I break it or did I fix it? <coughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> but why do you point towards me if it's not my fault? Oh, no. <laughs> no. In this example, oh, let me finish. Let okay. me finish. I'll save you. I'll save you. I like you. <laughs> so in this example, you can see that this is a legit use case for disabling the IRQ. So if one would like to have a lower IR, lower uh, I, uh, lower scheduling latency, they either would have to rework this code to make it even smaller <clears throat> or try to avoid this, this code stack in the CPU that it's running, <clears throat> right? But the example here is that we can, <clears throat> from just simply using the tool dash A50, we can get an information that points us reasonably well to the direction of what is causing the problem. <clears throat> and that can save a lot of time, lots of time. Mainly in the use case, for example, where we have at Red Hat, where we have customers running the system and then they file a, a JIRA, a, a call. Okay, my system is having this latency. If they run timer lot with this option, they will give us a starting point. And this starting point is already like a fingerprint for the problem because it's very likely that the problem that this person is hitting is the same problem that someone else already hit. And the benefit of always running all this infrastructure, always tracing, is that we never miss a case of, okay, I saw a latency, a spurious latency, and it happened, and I'm not tracing. So I don't know what happened that time. If I start tracing next time, it could be yet another problem. And then we find that problem. And then we, we say, oh, I, I'm glad I fixed the problem. 
And then they start running back again, and there is the previous problem yet hitting. And this causes a lot of frustration. Lots of frustration when you are supporting use case. So trying to always have the trace and always having a fingerprint of the problem helps a lot in the process of supporting people and supporting workload. And, and, and we have to be fair, most of the people delivering a real-time system is interacting with other people that are the actual users of the system. And trying to clean up this communication brings us a lot of, um, of, of calm and peace of mind and confidence on what we are doing. <clears throat> so there is another abstraction that there is in the tool, which is jitter. Jitter, or release jitter, is something when something is delayed not because of blocking or lower priority or because of interference, higher priority, but something outside of the scope of the operating system. And here is, for example, when, when we have like a, a system that has not, a, that doesn't have like an exit from idle setup, like disabling P states. When this is detected by the tool, it's saying, okay, there is an RQ latency of 40 microseconds. But the tool, the thing that was running was Swapper, it was idle. Right? So why is idle creating this problem? And then here's problem, it's point. It's exit from idle. And it also shows, okay, maximum RQ latency from idle. It's it's 40. So okay, there is a problem in the idle setup. So it's always pointing two directions. There will be more and more analysis added to it, right? This is just a one year of work editing this kind of analysis inside of it. But the more we collect it, these analysis inside the tool, the more we will keep accumulating the knowledge. Ahmed? Uh, uh, so do you also detect cases where the firmware steals the CPU from the kernel? Or? That's that is the added, or that's analyzed with another tool inside the RTLA, which is the hardware noise. Yeah. And then that's in the final slides. I, ex I talk about that. Oh. But yes, there is a tool to help on that case. <clears throat> there is even research on that case for, for when we use virtual machines. So here's one example of the thread latency. <clears throat> so we have a case where the IRQ handler latency was barely zero, <clears throat> right? was negligible. The IRQ latency was just uh, one microsecond. So okay, the IRQ was very fast. There is something on causing uh, a delay after the IRQ. <clears throat> In this case, I'm not using the real-time kernel. I'm using the regular kernel, so we can exemplify it better. So it's the non-RT kernel. So the IRQ duration, the execution time of my handler was nine microseconds. Good, it's not that bad. <clears throat> but still, my thread latency was 500 microseconds. What was running there in the kernel that caused this latency? But before going there, you see the interference, that is, when this thread was awakened and when it started running, there were higher priority things running on that CPU causing delay. What was those things? There was IRQ, another timer IRQ, right? Local timer, three microseconds, nothing. There were some software IRQs, the timer software IRQ and the RCU. This is the amount of interference that they added, still low number, like the percentage is very low. And we also had a thread running on that CPU before my thread was able to run. And it was the migration thread, which is a special kernel thread that has it at the highest priority. But it also added just a very low uh, latency. So, yet again, we need to look at the blocking thread. What was running on that CPU? In this case, it was a key worker running the compressed pages inside the ButterFS. So we can say, okay, that was the thing that caused the latency. How should I deal with that? One can either move this unbounded key worker to a, another CPU, removing it from that CPU, or one could try to edit it, like check it, Boundary scared inside this code. So the tool is pointing where the problem is, and then a, a person can start working from there, like more precisely. So that's that's the idea. It's not yet fixing the problem. It might fix with AI. No, not yet. We still have job security. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Okay, that was the auto-analysis. The auto-analysis, it analyzes traces, but there are other things in tracing that we can use to debug the problem. Because tracing has an infinity of uh, options, like lots of trace points that can help me show, understand the work queues and what was the thing being scheduled and so on. <clears throat> so 
The RTLA is a timer lot. Uh, the RTLA timer lot is a front end for the tracing tools. So it has natively, natively the support for enabling these trace options. The basic things are these trace points here. These trace points are part of the OS noise tracer, which inside the code, the timer lot tracer and the OS noise tracer, they are basically the same tracer with different workload and name, but they're all in the same file. <coughs> so it has these minimum events here that are responsible for creating this analysis. It's just these trace points. Why? Trying to reduce the overhead. And these trace points, they do in-kernel processing to understand the, what was the duration. It tries to remove the nested overhead one to the other. There is information on that paper. It's, it's too long to, to go into details here. On that paper I mentioned before, it has all the whys and why it saves time. <clears throat> but with these trace points here, we can, we can create that analysis. Uh, <clears throat> but, and here is just one example of, uh, of the trace. I run the timer lot, stop if it's more than 30 microseconds. You see here it will run, it will stop. Here's the auto-analysis. Oops. Just... But you see here there is a trace file in the, in the at the bottom. And this is the raw F trace output. <clears throat> And see, so you see the events, the stack trace. The tool makes them it beautiful in the auto analysis, but you can also read all the tracing information raw from here. But that's not all. As same on TV. It's not all <clears throat> because we can also enable the other existing trace points in the kernel to go deeper in the analysis. <clears throat> so we can enable the other trace points we can create filter for these trace points, and we can create the triggers like for histograms. Timing allowing our reach there. So <clears throat> here's one example of running the YouTube, better quality please. <clears throat> so here is that previous example, but it's also enabling these CADIN trace points, the work EQ trace points, the IRQ the Intel IRQ trace points, <coughs> regular IRQ trace points. So it's running the same thing, but giving more information that, that we could analyze in the trace. <coughs> As you can see, I'm not a good YouTuber because I could have run this faster. But I probably, yeah, show the trace. Go ahead, Daniel, show the trace. Yeah, okay, there's the free on page comment. There is, that was the blocking thread. <clears throat> the problem is that if I try to push forward here, it will leave the full screen. Okay, so reading the trace. As you can see here, we have way more trace points now. And then you can go deeper in the analysis, editing, piling up more things. So there is this IRQ work. That's the latency reported by the, the tracer. There is like this CAD waking, this CAD wake up events. So you can go in deeper and piling up things. <clears throat> so even more than that, we can use the other tracing things to figure out more statistical data. For example, on F trace, <clears throat> we can collect histograms of things. And these histograms can give us valuable information. Here, I, I will, in the video, I will show you copy and paste the, the command line that is in this page. Right? It's a very long command line. <clears throat> so, so here is copy and paste probably. Come on, YouTube, better quality, please. Yeah. Uh -huh. So just copying this very long command line. So it's saying timer lot, the top version of timer lot. And uh, it's enabling the OS noise NMI trace points and creating a histogram for those trace points of NMIs, for the, for the execution time of the NMIs. Also for the IRQs, I would like to create a histogram 
for all they are queues that I can show the execution time of all their queues. Same for software queues, same for thread. So <clears throat> as the system is running, an interesting fact. So it's running, collecting histograms, and these histograms are being saved in these files. But you can see here, it created a little bit of overhead, but it's just one microsecond more, right? Because there is always this trend, uh, editing more tracing, editing more overhead. But as long as this, this overhead is, is bounded to an acceptable value, it's okay. And, it, and at the beginning of the presentation, I showed like two microseconds as minimum. Now, even enabling all this trace points information and collecting histograms, it's just one more, 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 more uh, microsecond of overhead. It's acceptable for the kind of information that we have here. So, for example, it is showing that during that execution, there were NMIs on my CPUs. And these are the execution timings of the CPUs, of the, the NMIs. So, for example, there is an NMI that took that, that uh, how many, how long was it? So, there was one NMI on CPU 23 that took nine microseconds. In the CPU 22, it took 10 microseconds. So, it means that at least if this NMI happened concurrently with my timer, I would have at least 10 microseconds of uh, of, uh, of uh, latency. Now, having a look on IRQs, <clears throat> other IRQs. So you can see here, there is all this, all, here it's ordered by the CPU. On CPU 1, there were these IRQs. On CPU 2, there were t these and CPU blah, blah, blah. And here is the execution time of, this, of these IRQs. There was, here is the example, 32 microseconds. There was, in the CPU 23, oh no, in 22, there, we, there was one, uh, CPU 22, there was one IRQ that took 32 microseconds. It was a timer IRQ, right? So if this was the timer IRQ of my timer lot thread, and at the same time that this happened, an, uh, an NMI happened, my latency can compose already to 42, 10 plus 32. And then we start, can start speculating on these values and try to compose the latency from the worst values that happened during the execution, but not necessarily my sampling thread got to that case. So we can compose the worst case latency from the things that didn't happen in the worst order, but could have happened. And that links to the research I did in 2020. It's in part here, not all. <clears throat> And here is the, the histogram for threads. So the blocking thread for the threads, they were, they were lower than the IRQs, 10 microseconds, 11. So here, let's see, probably, uh, probably in the video, I stop in the video where I see a very large number. No, but you see it's around 10-ish. I think there are cases of, yeah, no, let's use 10 here. So there was this 10 from threads, 10 from NMIs, and uh, it was 30 something from IRQ, right? So it can be at least 50 microseconds if we get the worst case one after the other. But it didn't hit 50 here because that possible worst case didn't happen while sampling, but it could have happened. And then when we go, start going deeper in this analysis, we can have a better information. And the cost we see was just one microsecond more on the minimum latency. It's okay for the analysis that it gives. And as we are looking for bad numbers, it's, it's acceptable. This is an option that instead of running the, the thread in, news, in kernel space, it can be in user space. But it's even more, the timer lot can, here it's dispatching its own per CPU threads. But you can also use any thread of your system to go to sleep on the timer lot uh, file descriptor. And you can, um, in timer lot, we analyze the latency of that thread. For example, if you have like our, our middleware for automotive things, you can put your middleware of automotive things to sleep on the timer lot uh, file descriptor. And when it wakes up, the timer lot auto analysis will do an auto analysis of the wake up of that too. Not that. Yeah. My time is running short. Here's the user space tool. <clears throat> it will become the default option. Here it's, it's not yet the default option. Timer dash top dash u. 
it will add another variable here, which is it goes to user space, and then when it returns to user space, this is the execution, this is the latency. Goes to user space and return. So it would be the minimum time, the maximum time to give a res to reply to a, for example, to a network package going to the kernel space. <clears throat> so it's yet another metric. So instead of having one single metric, we now have a tree, and each one has an explanation for it. Let's see here, I think it's, yeah, histograms as well, so three values. I mean, there is this, there is this, this talk is online, and you guys can see, there is recording of it. I just need to run a little bit. So, by the way, going to the end of the presentation, there are some options, we can set a different period for these real-time tasks, for these real-time threads, we can set, a, limit the amount of CPU, we can set the duration, we can, by default, it runs a, of 5495 priority, but you can set other priorities to the measurement threads. You can use SCAD deadline, for example. These are the options. You can set the threads to other C, to other C group, not the default one, and you can disable autonomous, enable autonomous, and so on. And by the way, that was what Ahmed said. There is this case where the latency the latency in the operating system is what we are measuring, but there could be the case where the latency is caused by the hardware installing the threads. And so this is a tool that measures the, how much noise the, the hardware is adding to your threads. <clears throat> so w how does it work? It dispatches a per CPU kernel threads that disables interrupts and keep measuring the time. If there is a gap in time that was not caused by by an NMI, you can start blaming the hardware. So it, there was nothing in the kernel causing the, the latency, so it's from the hardware. And this is what this tool measures. It's also part of RTLA. And the idea is to accumulate these tools all inside RTLA. This uses the OS noise tracer that there is description on that paper. And this is the hardware lot version 2.0, let's say. With the evolution of timer lot. So before, uh, so before running the, the tracing analysis, beware that your latency can be, it's at least this case here, because if you hit the, your, the wake up of your thread, when the hardware is, uh, is running this noise, it can accumulate on your latency. And if you, remember I said 50-ish microseconds, if we sum these 10 microseconds more, my latency could be even 60, even though the sampling thread didn't get it. We can start playing with these compositions. So final remarks, it, so our Tamerlat integrates workload tracing and out analysis. It produces the summary for the latency spikes and, the, and it allows the user of more advanced and tracing. Uh, as I said, there are more tools inside RTLA. There's Tamerlat, OS noise, hardware noise. All these things, RTLA is part of the kernel, so it's inside the kernel source, so it's integral part of the kernel. There's, all the documentation is in the kernel documentation already. And then it, it can only get better. There is a tracer that I'm working which measures the execution time of your workload. It's based on the OS and OS uh, tracer. Uh, this work already integrates part of the formal analysis of scheduling latency. That is a research work I did during my PhD. It brings part of it, not all, but I need to bring it. This, the time lot it measures by sampling. The RTSL, which is this work here, it uh, measures all the things separated and then composes what would be the worst case execution time of the latency if the bad situation happened. And there is a formal proof of why this is the worst case uh, worst case chain of events. <clears throat> uh, we, I have been working with Paolo Bonzini and some students on integrating these with KVM so we can detect uh, when the noise is caused by the hypervisor and not by the host. And, and there is more things to come. Yeah. This presentation is actually a tutorial. So I made a tutorial and made a presentation from the tutorial. And here is the tutorial. It's like a written version of this presentation. And I will keep updating it over time.
And just, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Run, Sebastian, run. So you mentioned uh, sort of noise introduced by the hypervisor. Uh, mm -hmm. I work in cloud, so uh, we're often, you know, thinking about issues with customer VMs and things like that. Uh, how how does hypervisor noise uh, show up in like the current tracing architecture? So there is this there is this tool, right? Device noise tracer. What it does, it creates a kernel, a kernel, uh, it's a kernel thread, it, I will add the user space part, but basically it creates a thread that keeps spinning on the time and see if there was a time gap. When this time gap happens, like for on, the, on the hardware noise tool, because interrupts are disabled, it's basically only hardware happening, right? So this OS noise tool here, if you run on your, on, for example, on a VM, on, on a cloud provider, it will show how much CPU time your task is gaining from the virtual CPU. And it shows a percentage of it. And it starts blaming if it's a thread, another thread on your CPU, IRQs, or if it's hardware. When you are running on bare metal, it can only be hardware. When you're running on, on a cloud, on a virtual machine, it, it could be the hypervisor or the hardware. Yeah, it, it is could. There any, oh, sorry. <clears throat> is, is there any way to disambiguate between hardware pauses and like a hypervisor pause? That's a with research the current work. pooling, or that's the future work? That's the future work. Okay. That, that's a research work that I did with Paolo Bonzini, the, the KVM maintainer, and, and uh, uh, a student in, uh, in uh, Polymi, the University of Milan. Last follow up, I promise. Like, so what. How, how, how would you disambiguate? Like, is there any indicator? Because it just is. On, on the KVM, it knows when the vCPU was preempted by the hypervisor or not. If it was preempted by the hypervisor, it's something running on the hypervisor, another thread. If it wasn't preempted by the hypervisor, it's something that's even out of the control of the KVM. So it's harder. Okay, thank you. It was. So my name is Xu, I'm from ARM. Uh, thanks for your talk and uh, thanks for the work. Uh, so I, I wish I, I could know this tool earlier because then it may make my work er, uh, easier. So yeah. I, I, I never tried this tool before, but I used the trace CMD uh, to figure out the root cause of a large latency uh, when I testing on the ARM server cores. So what do you, uh, what do you think of that tool? And uh, also that you, I think this, the tool you presented has a as a nicer interface for the for the users, and you also mentioned that uh, I, I think what I really like the tool is that you can decompose the total latency into uh, small parts. So, for example, uh, how much latency is spent on an IRQ? But you also mentioned that the overhead is low. But how how's, how how did you do that? Uh, yeah. So just. Just want to hear about the comments of, mm -hmm. for the Trace AMD and your <coughs> tools. If you so, do any comparison in the yeah trace, nice features, Trace command the two Trace CMD. Stephen would correct me. It's, it's Trace command, the, the author of the tools. Oh, it's Trace command, Daniel. So Trace Trace CMD Trace command. It's an interface for the F Trace thing in kernel. Timer dot is one thing in the tracing in kernel. So you can use trace command to dispatch timer lot. It's you can like the, the RTLA the RTLA interface is one interface for the tracer, but you could you also do things like this. So do trace command. I'm developing things, it might crash my system because I'm developing things for timer lot and I'm using an RC kernel. If it crashes, it's because of these new things, not because of the things that are on the kernel. <laughs> trace command record dash p timer lot. So I'm recording the kernel events, <clears throat> but I'm saying I would like to use the timer lot tracer, not the function tracer. So here it's recording for a while. Control C, trace, you see it's a development kernel. 
It's the RC2. <laughs> it didn't crash. <laughs> Trace uh, command report. I think, it's, I think I need to run if sudo. You see, here's the. <clears throat> I can use the timer.tracer also with trace command because we it's all part of the F trace inside the kernel. <clears throat> the timer not does the same thing that the, the trace command does. It goes to the same interface, enables the same thing, collects the same thing, it's just a different interface. <clears throat> and, and the overhead will be the same. They're all they're all integrated on the same subsystem in the kernel. And what, there was about the composition something? You asked something about com ah. yeah. yeah. This there is a trade-off. When saving things to the trace buffer takes more time than processing in kernel, it's better to processing in kernel. When it's better to use in user space, it's better to write to the buffer and do processing in user space. After doing this for So there was a research on the runtime verification subsystem when I measure what is worth doing in kernel and what is worth doing in user space. And I got the knowledge that I learned on that work to figure out what was worth doing in the kernel and what was doing worth doing in user space. That's why it has these two components. It's trying to minimize those. And, and the decomposition, you can find the reason why on this academic paper. And this shows the f there is a theorem of this formal notation to explain how these things are composed. And then there is theorem and lemma and definition that composes that and these are the variables. This is not yet part of the kernel, but it will be. Hopefully. You, you mentioned that for arbitrary user space code to be subject to this analysis, it should sleep on the timer lat file descriptor can you are there code samples somewhere that shows how you're doing that or some type of documentation yeah there there is let me do here for for brazilians I w i'm looking like civil santos but that only works with brazilians as a joke you see he just looks from he's very kind <laughs> <laughs> so source git linux uh, tools, tracing, RTLA, ah, to hold the kernel. Uh, Sydney, Korg, no. Korg, yeah. This is the mirror of the thing I have in the kernel. These are my script. Uh, source, Linux, tools, tracing, RTLA, aha, sample. Here is a Python code of an application that uses the timer dot uh, file descriptor and measures the latency of any arbitrary task. And, and here it's in the code the sample. It's in Python because it's easier to understand Python, and the sample code would be smaller. It can be in any language. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of our most customer requests is I have this hardware kernel version XYZ I run cyclic test I have 100 microsecond and they want 60 and what's wrong right and then they send us the hardware by post and then we spend like two days to reproduce the problem just to start analyzing all the usual traces are we at a high confidence point that we can actually set a policy to our customers that no one gives us cyclic test results and we standardize that they start using RTLA first. We are moving into that direction. Yeah. We, we are moving into that direction inside Red Hat. Yeah, for, for now things are working fine. And you can use it to cross check one with the other. Anyone? 